the other day. I told the first part of the horror story that is my first tabletop RPG campaign. Before I delve into the story proper, I feel like it would help set up how ridiculous combat got to discuss a few things, at least briefly, before I get to the death of the elven Belmont and his subsequent replacement by a dwarven baby boomer. The GM had bastardized the action economy to such a degree that everyone, PC and NPC, were turned into action movie stars. Normally, there's only so much you can do in one turn of combat. If you charge, you can only make the one charge attack. If you take aim, you can only take the one aimed attack. You have to correctly position for a lightning attack, which gives you your full complement of attacks. The GM decided you could move and still do several attacks. Moreover, every single character could dodge and parry each individual opponent, against some opponents, that meant they were almost impossible to hit. If he wanted his bosses to not get destroyed by lucky crits or a party of 9 PCS, I often told him that he'd be better suited to switch the campaign to something like Pathfinder or D&D. He didn't listen. Moreover, the Aussie brought up a peculiar wording in Strike Mighty Blow and Mighty Shot. It increases the damage roll by plus 1. The damage roll. The Aussie argued that it turned a 9 into a 10, which triggered Ulrich's fury. This meant every character worth their salt had a 20% chance to have exploding dice. More if you had an impact weapon or if you were Saul. Saul's epic magic item, a rapier called the Red Lady, originally let him trigger Ulrich's fury on a 9 or a 10, but with the new rule, triggered it on an 8, 9, or 10. Almost everyone had magic items that were broken in one form or another, which only served to frustrate the GM because he felt that he could never actually challenge the party. But enough about that for now. The problem with the Darklands wasn't so much big instances of shitbaggery minus a few exceptions. The main problem was that the GM didn't know how to manage long travel time. A lot of sessions felt empty. There were, perhaps, 20 interesting sessions out of a year and a half of campaign. If he'd just cut out the boring and random parts, the game would have been much improved. I'm telling a bit of the Darklands out of order, brushing over some details, and not going into stories that are just, well, RPG stories instead of stuff that pertain to the GM being terrible. After the group left Kerak Kadrin, we soon found ourselves in the Darklands. After events detailed in the last post, I decided to retire my current character and bring in a new one in hopes of improving the GM's mood and his attitude towards me. I chose to kill off my elf rather than have him leave because I feel like deaths add stakes and opportunities for character development more than someone randomly disappearing. I told the GM this and, in hindsight, his voice seemed a bit too gleeful. In short, my character was killed by a snotling that morphed into a wolf after being put into a shock attack gun from 40k. It was a death that left a poor taste in my mouth, a fact that was further exacerbated by the GM having everyone move swiftly along after he died, not even giving the characters time to reflect on one of their comrades dying. I Arvath and Leif ended up attempting to revive my character with necromancy and somehow managed to summon a chaos demon of Hashet instead that the party had to kill. The GM had this habit of having everything I Arvath, Leif, and Phineas did turn into a joke. Nothing ever worked for them, even if they were actually capable of doing the thing they were attempting. Successes always seemed like bare passes, even when they rolled multiple degrees of success, and failures were always catastrophic and slapstick with them. Phineas's player ended up getting kicked near the end of the Darklands arc when he realized this fact while Iarveth's player left. Leif's player either never saw that he was mostly a monkey whose job was to dance for the GM's amusement, or he never cared. Anyway, out with my elven bounty hunter and in with my dwarven engineer. I designed him, much like my elf, to be able to support the group. Many characters used firearms or technology of some kind, so I chose to make a crafter that was capable of building things for people. His backstory was that he was a semi-famous dwarf from the engineer's guild that had married young after his clan realized he was a genius. His wife turned out to be a total bitch who browbeat him constantly actively sabotaged his job out of spite for their marriage, and generally made it her life's mission to make him miserable. In spite of that, he had two children with her, who he talked about constantly to the party. This wasn't his first excursion into human lands by far, 
His idea of a vacation was to sometimes tag along with adventurers on their journeys and offer what help he could. This character's personality is probably what held the party together through the next year of the campaign. I do not exaggerate when I say it took the better part of a year and a half to traverse the Darklands. Factoring in the fact that we didn't play a few weeks due to holidays, that's some 72 odd sessions. Almost every single one of these sessions played out exactly the same way. The group chatted for a bit, divulged bits of their backstory, my dwarf provided emotional support to at least two people, and we found ourselves in the middle of a random encounter from Final Fantasy. That's genuinely the only way I can phrase that, as the encounters made just about as much sense sometimes as a dramatic warp onto a battle screen followed by enemies appearing. It became very clear to everyone, not just me, that our GM was very much an adversarial grams. There were several points where we realized enemies were coming so we set up ambushes, trying to gain an advantage in the upcoming encounter. There were times that when Saul and Ossel would try to use their absurd stealth roles to try and navigate an encounter with subterfuge but, again, this never worked. In the case of the ambushes, twice we sat there, realized nothing was coming, and were subsequently ambushed as we moved to see why they weren't coming. When we asked the GM how they knew we were there, his explanations only made sense in the context of someone, like the GM for instance, who had a complete context of both sides. Stealth was made nearly impossible due to everyone having plus 20 perception, some talent, and decent intelligence. The GM rolled for every individual character that could potentially catch them and he rolled dice for this campaign in secret. Between all of these factors, someone would inevitably spot Saul or Othel. For four years, without fail, whenever an enemy passed a perception test, the GM would say the exact phrase the exact way, he spots ya. Q Ossel and Orsaul having to hold their own until the rest of the party could catch up and save them. A major hurdle of the campaign at this juncture was that the backstories of almost every character was paper thin. Half of the party hadn't known the first thing about the Warhammer setting before the campaign started and the other half had their characters refuse to talk about much. The few NPCs we had with us were quick to dismiss us as well. We had Spank, Tank, three slayers that were driving the wagons, and a halfling craftsman named Pip. The slayers told everyone to fuck off, Spank said everything was none of our business, and Tank was borderline mentally retarded with 12 intelligence. This left us with a single NPC to actually converse with. Conversations always eventually meandered to nothing much of value. There comes a point when you talk to someone enough that, outside of some outside factors providing something to talk about, you run out of things to actually talk about. The party reached that point around week 20. And then there were the ogres. Oh god, the ogres. I'd like to say that the GM threw ogres of every shape, size, and variety at us. That would be giving him far too much credit. Every encounter with those damn ogres was always the same. There would typically be 10 other things, armored head to toe in plate armor. They'd show up, not give the party any time to talk, and then immediately engage us in combat. Between their numbers, their 13 something damage resistance, and their hard hitting weapons, the party almost always found themselves on death's doorstep at the end of every encounter. Every encounter also inevitably turned into Guy, Nikolai, Ossel, and Saul doing the actual fighting while Phineas healed, my dwarf managed to tank thanks to a homebrew tower shield, and everyone being various flavors of useless. There might be some reading who think that maybe, just maybe, this crucible of constant combat was the GM's way of turning us into monsters, career and stat wise, before we hit the Cathay part of the campaign called the Cathay campaign. Instead, the GM fought fully half the party tooth and nail on the directions they wished to take their character. Phineas's character said something I found very profound once when we were reminiscing about this campaign. These aren't our characters, he said, they are the GM's. We're here to play out the GM's vision of our character rather than our own. It's insane how right he turned out to be. Allow me to go over the bullshit every single person had to go through on their quest to stat advancement. So guy had it the easiest, as the GM can hardly argue with himself. He was a questing knight before we even hit the Darklands. To his credit, he never had his character find the grail. That said, he hardly needed to considering how fantastic questing knight is as a career. 
Nikolai also had it easy because he was the GM's best friend. He started in the noble career, zoomed through winged lancer, and ended up having incredible stats in almost every single other area. There's more bullshit that happens with Nikolai, career wise, but that's a story for when we get to mind. Ossel went through fully half the careers in the book because the GM liked him. By the end of the campaign, the two things he didn't excel in were melee combat and magic. Ulrich was unfairly locked out of Wizard Lord. I say unfairly because Phineas was given a homebrew career that made him the equivalent of a Wizard Lord despite being a hedge witch. The GM decided he was going to suddenly be a stickler about career trappings. I later noticed that he only did this with people he disagreed with. Iarvath's player envisioned his character as a revolutionary and an outlaw. So he wanted to take his character down the crime lord and outlaw chief career paths. The GM forbade him from one on the grounds that he didn't have a band of outlaws and the other on the grounds that he didn't have a criminal empire, despite saying in his backstory that he was the leader of a band of outlaws. This left him stuck in the targeteer career. The GM barred him from going into master thief when he tried. The GM did everything in his mortal power to keep Saul out of the champion career. Nikolai's player and the GM both hated this career with a fiery passion. They complained that it was overpowered and someone with plus 40 weapon skill and plus 40 ballistic skill would break their precious game. The GM tried to argue that the career was meant purely for the champion of a military unit despite the career description itself allowing for broader definitions of what exactly a champion was. Eventually, the GM smugly declared that if Saul could find enough best quality weapons, he could have the career. My elf got a last laugh from beyond the grave as I arveth, random and cocky as ever, decided to throw my bounty hunter's arsenal of best craftsmanship gear at Saul's feet, giving him ownership over them. The GM was fucking livid on this point. Saul's player also quietly worked his way up to Master Thief by the end of the campaign. Phineas's player wanted to go into Noble. Obviously that was weird, because he was a hedge wizard. However, the GM was hoisted by his own shoestrings because he decided that Phineas was the old man of the moot, the supposed spiritual leader of the halflings in the moot. This technically made him some sort of noble or authority figure. The GM eventually just stomped his foot down, gave a hard no, and told Phineas's player to be happy with the game breaking career that he and the Aussie had homebrewed. Seraphina's career progression is one that makes me genuinely feel bad for her and her player. Despite her cutting her writing teeth on a One Piece roleplay forum, Seraphina's player didn't much enjoy combat. For her, it was more about the story, about the characters, and how they interacted with one another. Seraphina wasn't supposed to be a combat character. What combat potential she had was more designed for flavor than efficiency. Her character was eventually changed completely by the events of the campaign. The GM had us encounter undead elven whites, bound to the land by duty. After we killed them, their leader possessed his own axe and implored we return the item he was guarding to Hoth. To make a long story short for brevity's sake, her character ended up getting the axe. Her character ceased being a dainty fellowship based Disney princess with a bad attitude and turned into an axe wielding badass. Now, let me be clear, it was actually very cool, especially given she eventually augmented herself with what was basically a dire wolf and a tiger, but the axe thing wasn't her choice. It was forced upon her to make her character capable of keeping up with the rest of us. Considering how much she took a shine to her animals, if I had been the GM, I would have had her find items that helped make her pet stronger. I'd make her combat potential be more about the combat potential of her pets more than her own capabilities. But I digress. Leif literally gave zero fucks. At several points, the GM, the Aussie, and myself realized he hadn't spent his experience in months. The GM and I would actually put aside our differences to catch him up, although the GM always got mad when I informed his player about how some careers were essentially trap choices or NPC careers. I wanted my character to advance down through the engineer careers until I hit artillerist. From there, I wanted to jump into captain and sit there comfortably, given that gave me decent combat capability and amazing out of combat utility. The GM cock blocked me from captain. Why? Because your character's not the group leader. I asked him who the group leader was. The GM responded that Nikolai was a leader of the PCS, because of course he was. 
I then proceeded to argue that multiple people listened to my character in dire situations, looked up to him, and enjoyed his company if that was his argument. The GM said that no one respected my character and, in the following sessions, had NPCs not acknowledge his ideas or treat him with respect to accentuate his point. So, as the A-team, as the GM so affectionately called Guy, Nikolai, Ossel, Saul, and Serafina all began to hit their end game careers, the appointed B-team were sidelined, aside from the wizards. This contributed in no small part to the frustration I Arvith and Phineas's players felt towards the campaign. Phineas's character also began to suggest that the group should migrate from Rolls to Roll20 and integrate a proper combat grid. There were several times when the GM had enemies start several dozen meters away from the group and charge them within a round, forcing everyone into melee combat. Moreover, how many enemies were hit by AoE attacks like bombs and magic depended on the GM's mood that day. Considering the GM also had a burning, seething hatred for magic, the answer was that AOs barely hit anything at all. The GM also had a habit of trying to force the party into situations where they'd kill one another. He thought that internal conflict made for good characterization. In my opinion, this is one of those ideas that sounds good on paper. The party is at one another's throats, but they put aside their differences and band together cool the reality is that sometimes, a player character can end up dying or salt can spill out of character. The best instance of this was about halfway through our journey through the Darklands. Our party managed to unearth the great secret of the dwarven people, a lost hold. Dwarfs as a people have a very long memory, so this is kind of a big deal. The four sessions we spent exploring this dungeon were some of the best of the campaign. It felt like a good old fashioned dungeon crawl through an area steeped in lots of story for us to explore. The GM, for better or worse, really likes dwarfs and can tell a good story when dwarfs are involved. The party comes to learn that the keep fell not to chaos, greenskins, or skaven, but to civil war. This civil war began over a ruby the size of a man's torso that was perfect in every way. Dwarfs, as a greedy folk, fell to infighting over it until the king was murdered by his own hammerers, who tried to escape with the ruby only to fall themselves at the hands of a runesmith who used golems to kill them and hide the ruby before taking the slayer's oath. When the party found the ruby, they were faced with a terrible choice, sell it or destroy it. My character saw in the gem the downfall of his people to the worst aspects of their nature. When he saw the gem, he thought of his son going to war for their king to hold against all other dwarfs who would covet it for themselves. He asked the rest of the group to help destroy the ruby with him but Phineas, Iavath, and Saul were having none of it. Saul's player was a good sport about the whole thing but Phineas and Iavath's players were taking it very personally when the group told them no. There's a part of me that actually understands their frustrations 100%. The game was stacked against them, their characters weren't just debating neutral parties such as myself, they were debating the GM's GM PC, the GM's appointed in character leader played by his best friend, and one of the other GM's close personal friends through Ossal. I can't blame them for being pissed. That ruby, even destroyed, caused very serious friction between the players not just the characters. The friction came to a head as our characters actually managed to find civilization within the Darklands. Pigbeta has apparently been featured in a few stories and has lore on it, but the GM ran it like Bard to Town from Mad Max. If Bard to Town was manned by nothing but Monty Python stereotypes, Frenchmen, corner children with cockney accents, and pig fuckers, Pigbeta further served to frustrate the party. By this point, Leif was dead due to being, well, a chaos dwarf who openly displayed his powers to the party and had been replaced by a snotling. It was here in Pigbutter that we picked up his proper replacement character, Breadbird. The rest of the players took to him rather quickly because he was the only person in that town who wasn't a dipshit. For the first time in roughly a year, our party had people to talk to besides one another. We had things to spend money on. Our characters were given neither respect nor coherence. The entire town turned frustrating very quickly as every conversation turned into the GM making our characters the butt of jokes. Even Nikolai and Serafina weren't immune to this. Serafina was called a tart by an NPC. Nikolai, to quote his player, sensed a disturbance in the force, 
Flash stepped like a bleach character to this scene, and Falcon punched this NPC so hard that him being alive was in question. I are this player, Phineas is, and I all had a good laugh about this after the session when this happened. It was clear that Nikolai and Sarah Phineas players were wanting to push for a romance, given they were dating in real life. That would be fine if they actually hit any of the beats of a love story. Instead, Nikolai acted vaguely creepy to her several times and Sarah Fina, her player blinded by her love for Nikolai's player, fell head over heels in love with him by the time the campaign was over. The relationship had absolutely no chemistry. If there's a single aspect of the campaign that I wish everyone reading this could be flies on the wall to witness, it would be this romance that was more forced, soulless, and loveless than Anakin and Padmin Attack of the Clones. Romance aside, this was one of the first times we as a group ever approached the GM and voiced concerns to him. Before, it had mostly been me. Occasionally, Phineas's player would chime in. We told him that we wanted actual characters to bounce off of and not Monty Python stereotypes. Very briefly, we got this. Why was it very brief because the GM had an army of ogres show up from the nearby mountains to attack everything it felt like we were being trolled at that point. The thing we'd openly complained about the most showed up in insane numbers. We fought our way through them, as per usual. It was as tedious a fight as ever we'd fought against the ogres. The tedium was slightly broken up by Nikolai actually talking us out of one single encounter with the ogres. Nikolai had to ace 4 charm checks in a row and offer a family heirloom to do this, but the absolute madman actually managed to do it. The GM, of course, rewarded Nikolai only 25 EXP for this in a system where advancements were 100 EXP. He said that roleplay should be its own reward and we shouldn't skip combat if we want experience, never mind that you could purchase non-combat skills with experience. Our party ends up escaping Pigbutter after 4 ogre fights in a row, there was no boss. There was nothing unique about any of these fights. There were just more stat blocks to wade through. We eventually escaped into a haunted forest because Spank, the GM's railroad conductor for those who don't remember, told us we'd have to go through a toll booth set up by the ogres otherwise. Considering everyone hated these ogres and wanted nothing to do with them at this point, we fucked right off into this haunted forest. It was at this point that Phineas was kicked. He told the GM that he was a terrible GM, he should fuck off, and that his game wasn't fun for anyone. After he was kicked, Iarvath's player left as well, wanting to stand in solidarity with his friend. Before he left, he posted a gif of a guy giving a middle finger in the chat. The GM considered this an absolutely unforgivable crime. He said that Iarvath's player had insulted all of us with that middle finger and banned him from ever being in a game that he ran again. This and the GM wondering if Phineas and Iarvath's players were trolls doing a long con have remained in jokes between Iarvath's player and I to this day. But, to get back to the game for those of us foolish enough to stick around, for once the GM actually managed to set up some good atmosphere. He narrated the lantern light being all we had. Ambient noises were described. Shadows darted past us constantly. The players all felt a little unnerved, wondering what exactly it was that the GM was going to pull. One of us realized that Pip, our halfling craftsman, had been kidnapped. My character had adopted Pip as his pseudo-grandson and rallied half the party to go find him. My character, Ossal, and Saul went off to find him while the rest pressed on. After a long, tense chase scene with an opponent that seemed quite capable at duping us, we found Pip tied to a stake in the middle of an abandoned quarry. As it turned out, an ogre hunter had stolen Pip. This ogre hunter had a pet woolly mammoth that seemingly had control over winter itself. What followed was my character and Saul stealing what the GM clearly meant to be Ossal's fight. Ossal was one-shotted by the hunter. The fight boiled down to my character handling the mammoth while Saul handled the ogre. The GM had decided my character wasn't going to be a dwarven engineer by this point. Instead, he was going to be a dwarf defender from D&D. He was given a suit of magical armor that give him absurd DR and the ability to not be moved or tossed aside by anything. This meant the mammoth simply could not pass through my character, leaving him open to shoot it to death with the revolver he'd taken from my last character. Saul, meanwhile, was too fast for the ogre and closed the distance between them. 
My character killed the mammoth and Saul cut the ogre's arm off, seemingly killing him. For once, Saul's player and myself were wholeheartedly happy about the encounter that just happened. Our characters got time to shine. We fought a boss that was clearly meant for the precious main characters, and we felt like badasses instead of side characters on his railroad. Nikolai's player later informed us that the GM considered the fight a total, complete failure because we weren't challenged enough by it. While we were busy fighting the boss fight, the rest of the party was ambushed by, who would have guessed it, even more ogres. The party ended up in a mad dash through the forest, where they ended up at a beach with an ogre-sized boat nearby. We all stole the boat and hauled us out of there. Out of the forest walked the ogre that we thought was dead. He shot a crossbow bolt the size of a ballista bolt at our boat which led to us taking on water fast. Despite Saul being the one to defeat him, it was also that he gave a respectful salute to. Our party managed to keep the boat afloat long enough to make it to one of the low points of the campaign, the Dragon Isles. The Dragon Isles. Not even once. Fuck these islands. The GM, Nikolai, and Ossel had all been playing a lot of Ark together around this time. This became obvious when the group encountered some dodos and half of a session turned into an Ark joke about the damn things. After the joke died down, Pip informed us that we needed to go into the island and find a certain kind of tree. If we could hold back the sap from this tree, we could probably patch up the boat and float our way to Ind. Seeing no other alternative. We went into the forest to find what we needed. The Dragon Island seemed very cool at first. Our first combat encounter was against a Canosaur. The session ended mid-fight against it, and we were informed that Ulrich was being kicked from the game. His player had apparently ditched us a few times in previous weeks to play other games and the GM didn't like that much at all. So, he was unceremoniously removed and the Canosaur took off into the jungle before we could retrieve him. I consider it a failing of my character that he didn't immediately turn to the forest and march off to find the thing with dwarven determination considering he loved every single member of the group like his surrogate children at this point. But, instead, we trekked on. We fought a Final Fantasy random encounter against a dragon turtle the size of a city block. The bullshit started when we encountered Lizardman. At first, it was pretty standard, easy combat. The party fell into its usual groove. The frontliners hit things very hard. The range characters shot things. The GM kept having us roll perception tests and informing us that he failed. Out of nowhere, in the middle of a turn, he started telling people to roll minus 30 toughness checks. People began to fail these checks and fall down, completely paralyzed. When Ossal, myself, and Saul, the people with the best perception, rolled a 3, a 7, and a 4 to find the source of these tests, the GM noted we didn't beat the concealment test of whatever shot at us, although we did notice a poison dart in the necks of our teammates. The party was soon overwhelmed and fell. The party felt very frustrated because the loss felt like it had been forced upon us. I've heard lots of people scoff at the idea of an adversarial GM because the GM is going to win every single time they truly wish to win for they can control everything from behind the scenes until the party fell. This is a perfect example of that as our characters had genuinely no chance of success in this encounter. Ossel tried being clever and crawling up to hide in the canopy. He was spotted and shot with a poison dart. Serafina tried to use her new axe to chop down trees to knock them down. Suddenly, the trees went from regular sized trees to great redwood trees that would take hours to knock down. Our party woke up mostly naked and dangling from cages. The lizardmen were planning something. We all managed to free ourselves and resolved to get our stuff back. The GM said that everyone, even the people just standing there, had to roll concealment. Considering how many people were in the party, it seemed inevitable that one of us would fail. Somehow, no one did. With everyone having to roll anyway, the group decided to say fuck it and stick together. We got spotted just as we found our gear and it turned into an orgy of combat as people desperately tried to don their gear. We were eventually cornered by the lizardman. A dragon dramatically flies down, the Aussie doing his best deathwing impression for he apparently controls this creature. In the midst of a dramatic monologue, the GM has us get saved by the ogre hunter from earlier. He'd replaced the mammoth with the carnosaur that ate Ulrich. We were told to run away, so we did. 
we ran back to the beach and had to defend Pip against an army of lizardmen as we patched up our ship. Industrial was just on the horizon. The GM had informed us that he needed a break from Gming because of all the stress certain people were causing him and that the Aussie would be taking the reins of the campaign for a bit. Many of us were excited by the prospect of the Aussie Gming instead. I for one was very excited, given that I found him to be a much better GM than our actual Grams. There was, however, one last terrible thing that befell us before we got to mind. The party saw a ship manned by ogre pirates approaching us. Everyone immediately went into battle mode, given all of the previous encounters we'd had with ogres up to this point. The ranged characters shot the noblers manning the water wheels propelling the ship until they were dead in the water. The GM had the ogre captain begin to monologue while describing the other ogres getting into battle station. My character had a bag that contained, at this point, 32 handmade bombs. He tossed it onto the enemy ship, shot it, and blew that ship right up. If that were that, it'd just be a pleasant water cooler story. The GM calmly had me roll for damage before he declared that my character was caught in the blast radius as well. No other PC. Not the boat we were on. Just my character. He said that I'd have to be standing on the very edge of the ship to toss the bag to the other ship and get a good shot. I told him that I'd pass my strength roll to toss the bag fair and square by his own rules and I didn't see why I couldn't back up first. His argument then turned into there being a wagon behind my character on the ship. Mind you, he'd never described a wagon being behind me before this moment. After argument and Seraphina's character sounding like she was on the verge of tears, she had really taken to my character, given that Seraphina saw him as a surrogate father figure, the GM declared that I burned a fate point. He proceeded to say the ogres all rolled a natural one on a 1d100 and dodged out of the way of the explosion. Then, a Skaven submarine emerged from nowhere. This Skaven fight was a slog that took us 2 hours and left everyone mentally exhausted. The GM explained that he'd just wanted us to talk with the ogres and work with them against the Skaven army. Saul's player asked why he thought our characters would ever consider working with ogres considering they'd spent the past year and a half of our actual real life lives harassing us during at least one session a month. The GM said that wasn't his problem. It was at this point, as the GM handed the reins to Nikolai's player, that I decided that I wanted to switch characters again. I believe I articulated my reasoning very well when the Aussie asked why. I wanted my character to make gear for the party, as I said. The GM made every item I may take a month's worth of sessions to build, even simple things like a pistol for Saul. Meanwhile, Pip could cook up whatever wonder the GM decided he wanted to introduce that week in less than a day. It felt very frustrating to play second fiddle to an NPC. Furthermore, there were times when the GM introduced items I simply couldn't outdo. For example, Breadbird. Leif's new character, wanted a brace of pistols. My character told him that he could do this. In the next session, the GM has a treasure chest wash up on the beach. When Breadbird opens it, he finds a pair of magical pistols with all sorts of cool effects on them. There was nothing I could do to beat that. Serafina, who was promised a sniper rifle and seemed quite happy to have it, was suddenly given an Ithilmer axe and was converted into a Malay character. Despite him being a very fun character to roleplay as, he simply wasn't fun to play in any gameplay capacity. So, I made the decision to have him go back home with the knowledge he'd gained in the Forgotten Dwarf Hold, also bearing word of an impending chaos dwarf attack on Kerak Kadron. The party was sad but pretty much everyone understood. And with that, we got to mind. You'd think the horror story would end with the GM deciding to sit back and merely play for a bit. Oh how wrong you'd be given how much he quickly came to hate my next character.